everybody for coming today. It's great to see so many people here for our 2018 AGM. But before the AGM, which is at 3.30, we have uh, the Memorial David Beetson uh, address to be delivered by our trustee, Jeff Leland. That's starting now. And then there'll be a cup of tea. And at 3 o'clock, there's a panel discussion between the Minister of Broadcasting. 2 o'clock. Two o'clock, thank you. Just, just checking. Two o'clock uh, between the Minister and Paul Thompson from RMZ. But uh, I'd like to hand over to uh, Jeff Leland to deliver the very first Dave Beeson Memorial Address. Thank you, thank you Miles. <laughs> tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Um, I do feel really privileged to be asked to deliver this inaugural lecture. Um, and in front of such an auspicious company, and so many of you. Um, it'll be a short speech. I haven't actually timed it, so <laughs> it's likely to be short. Um, and I'll try not to meander, um, though my opening remarks may seem a little oblique. Um, others have lauded David's contribution to the intellectual life in New Zealand um, and his roles in broadcasting, aviation, tourism, as a journalist, press secretary, magazine editor, media commentator, broadcaster, policy developer, presenter, interviewer. And one thing I'd forgotten about, his role in the um, leading role in the 2000 millennium celebrations, which seems so long ago. Uh, my role, though, really is to, um, to remind us of his legacy. And so I, I assume uh, my hope is that these lectures will continue year after year for quite some years. And now how we need to be steadfast in our advocacy uh, for public media, even though things are looking rosier than this time last year, quite a bit rosier. My first encounter was with David was in the mid-1980s when he was the editor of the New Zealand Listener, when the Listener was a better magazine than it is now. Uh, not so obsessed with health prices and health issues. Uh, I was, uh, he was working out the Bowen State Building in, in Wellington. I was working in the same building in the audience research of Broadcasting, BCNZ, Broadcasting Corporation New Zealand. That's quite old. Um, it was my first job in New Zealand after returning from studies in, in the U USA and a short-term position at the British Film Institute. My role there was to do qualitative audience research, the kind of research that investigates the motivations and responses to media content, not counting things. But it was my first illuminating experience with ratings, um, qualitative measurements in Nielsen, AC, Nielsen, AC Nielsen's words, which claim to record presence in a room where a TV set is on. I was wondering about that. Is that the same thing as watching television? Anyway, this experience led to a deep and abiding disbelief in the efficacy of this way of describing audience, be audience behaviour, and I've been a disbeliever in ratings ever since. I, I never asked David about his opinion about ratings. I believe he probably was one of those media professionals that publicly supported them because it was only currency to measure success. Privately, probably thought they were a load of horse manure. And I've encountered that with quite a few media professionals. Anyway, but that's a topic for another day. The reason why I sought out David in the mid-1980s, because I'd started writing a regular column for the listener about audience research, mainly working with David's deputy editor, Helen Pask. I wandered down the halls of the building one day to suggest to David that I could also write an occasional book review. review. Starting with a piece on a monograph by Massey University sociologist Brennan Wood, who applied Marxist theory, theory, Marxist theory to analysis of television news. I still remember the look of complete disbelief on David's face at the sheer audacity of someone coupling Karl Marx with the production of television. <laughs> at this point, I realised that our politics didn't match, uh, for I was more receptive to the idea that news production did in fact embody processes of power, reinforcement of political norms, and implied assent from viewers. A kind of Marxist ideas to apply to media. But in respect of David, it didn't inhibit friendly conversations when we met again. In the ensuing years, 
In fact, one of the things I really liked about David was his willingness to listen, acknowledge, and acknowledge that academics had something useful to add to debates about the role of the media in New Zealand life. And this, but the same cannot be said about some of his contemporaries. But I'm not the only one to encounter David's generosity and open-mindedness. In fact, Roger Horrocks, and that's a little strange that Roger's sitting in the back there, but I'm going to quote Roger. And I sent out invitations to a number of people when I was preparing this talk, um, inviting their memories of, of David as well. So Roger very, very generously sent me back some really um, long reply, uh, most of which, which I can quote. But Roger um, worked closely with David when they were both on the New Zealand On Air board, and he, Roger sent me the following candid comments. David had a rich lifetime experience of broadcasting, which stood in strong co contrast to the politicians and politically appointed members of various boards who fiddled around with broadcasting without really knowing what they were doing. They were both Labour and National examples. We can probably quote a few, cite a few. David had a deep understanding of that territory. He was a man of integrity, in my experience, a person with principles who didn't play games. There were not qualities you could take for granted in the fields of politics and broadcasting administration through the 1980s and 90s. He had known New Zealand broadcasting where it still had a, a public service spirit, and he remained wonderfully loyal to that. The history of the last 30 years had been the gradual victory of commercialism and populism over public service. David kept the faith. And it mattered so much to him that he never stopped trying, trying to hold back the tide. Whenever I met him in the last years, he would talk of new initiatives, new possibilities. He never stopped campaigning. And that, that also has been my experience of David. Roger describes David as a great defender of the idea, idea of public service at its best. In his own words, he, in David's own words, he grew up in a world where the communication's basic task was defined simply, inform, educate, and entertain, i.e. not to pontificate, not to declaim viewpoints, not to share personal prejudices and judgments. Furthermore, David believed that the core values of the news media, in his own words, should be fairness and equity. Two very powerful words. Because, in his own words, it is in the common interest that public media de delivers those important non-commercial values in a ways that reflect the needs and interests of the diverse communities that must interact in our society. David was also an innovative thinker. Even in the late months of his, year, of his life, he was, when he was wheelchair-bound, wheelchair he was offering challenging and innovative ideas, his iMedia, public media project, for example, his ways of promoting and protecting public media spaces and voices, but framed with acute awareness that technology was bringing enormous changes in media production and delivery, and that things would never be the same again. His stance was not nostalgia for things past, but motivated by need to preserve the best of media in the new environment, when, which in his words were eating the New Zealand mainstream media's lunch, dinner and breakfast. Last time I heard a public presentation from David was the address he gave to the Agenda 2020 seminar in AU, at AUT last year. He provided an overview of the challenges facing the media, both globally and locally, then revealed one of his new initiatives, new possibilities. He proposed a new or renewed role for New Zealand broadcasting, television in particular, and anticipating and managing risk. Most particularly natural and technological crises, with their potential to disrupt life in both the short term and the long term. I think we have seen sufficient examples in recent times, both locally and globally, of the urgency for crisis management. David's proposal was to use very significant spare capacity on advertising free New Zealand public goods for advertising free New Zealand 
public goods local content, uh, specifically using downtime on the parliamentary channel. For those periods of national or regional states of emergency, interaction and local content neglected by mainstream broadcasters. I don't think David had any time for lay so fear or she'll be right attitudes. You know, well, she'll be right, or turn out, we'll cope. Um, these disasters will come along, we'll get over them. I don't think that was his attitude. And I think that framed this whole notion, this idea that he was developing. And to me, it was quite something I hadn't really given much thought to. Um, you know, we are facing moments of crises. He was thinking them through a way of actually dealing with moments of crises. So, I have friends in Helensville who were still waiting for reconnection of electricity a week after the recent storms. Storms two weeks ago. I don't know if they've got it back now. I doubt if they have. David would have pointed to this event as an example of risk realised. The lack of communication, for example, between Vector and its customers was a recurrent complaint. Together with suggestions of degraded infrastructure. Now, a storm of two weeks ago, sunshine is day, we easily forget about it, but I think we are of a mindset now that we will, those, those, will, those events will come again and, and seemingly with increasing regularity. The storms were an event of media magnitude, we can no long, but we can no longer dismiss the possibilities of events of greater magnitude. So David was looking towards the future, at a time when most of us would be obsessed with our, our imminent end of, of mortality, he was looking forward to the bigger picture, very much New Zealand, how it might cope in the world. When David died, I think we lost a champion for public media, and he will be con to continue to be missed. Others will step up, and I think better public media is one of the... Um, groups that will step up to fill the space, but it is a space that can too easily get colonised by self-appointed, know-nothing commentators and simplistic thinkers. I think you know who I mean. <laughs> As Roger comments, um, many New Zealanders alive today have grown up, and Roger and I have had, both had similar experiences of you know, dealing with students who have grown up in a very different world the one we grew up in. Many New Zealanders alive today have grown up in a world of neoliberal thinking and lack any clear understanding of the principles of public service broadcasting. In remembering David, we need also to remember that concept and that tradition. And we also, if we are in a position of teaching, learning, passing on knowledge and wisdom, we also have to remember that, remind those younger ones of today of what came before, what we have now, and that we can return back to it if we wish. So, um, Te Roto Iti Mahara in loving memory, David. And it was short. What I did, but one what I wanted to do to leave a bit of time at the end, because I said I sent out this invitation to people to share their memories of David. Um, and Roger, as I say, kindly sent back this really great reply but I didn't get any others, and I, I wanted to provide some space at the end of my short talk for other people to share their memories, because I think that should be a part of this moment. So if you have a memory, uh, a, a recollection, um, something interesting to say about, Rod, about um, David, it is an opportunity now. Yeah, I remember um, actually that I was... Um, I, I came in contact with him a day, obviously, I'd watched him on TV many times as a young as a boy, and um, it was pretty all inspiring to come in contact with him through uh, CBB and RBP. And we had lots of little get togethers and meetings, and one of the things I remember him saying over and over, getting quite passionate about, was there will be a TV channel, a public service TV channel before I die. <laughs> absolutely vehement about that. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. But yeah. the good news is that it seems to be about to happen. Yeah. So, it, and we, we, you know, so I think that's really good. Um, yeah. But also, I think that it's important to keep what David stood for alive as well, which is the purpose of these, uh, 
this uh, memorial speech. Thank you, Miles. I, I was lunching yesterday with a teacher friend, and I mentioned I was doing this talk, and she said, well, I was on the same group as David for the People's Commission on, on um, Broadcasting. Yeah. Yep, last year. He said he was the most vehement, the most passionate, the most engaged of all members on that group. And this is a time when his health was not great. And so it was a reminder to me just how engaged he was right to the last, uh, last days of his life. When we quite understandably, we could have assumed him to kind of be absorbed with his own, his own interests, his own Excuse health. Me, I'm Catherine Saunders, you were someone I was told I should get in touch with, and I didn't, so... I'm easily forgotten. I'm telling these stories of David to acknowledge that David, when Lizzie met David, had a three sons, and his father was, and I remember him when Lizzie met David, had known David as a, I put him on a school bus when he was in short pants, <laughs> 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 and I remember he was, he never sat down on that school bus, always the gentleman, he was always swinging from a piece of leather, he stood up to school bus. But when David and Lizzie met, it was a meeting of two extremely strong characters yeah. and formidable minds, and there was a great magnetism between them, and I don't think David would ever have achieved what he did for all of us in these last few decades without the support of Leslie. Her yeah. challenging and intuitive mind and a highly skilled politician, I might add as well. <laughs> so um, I just thought it would be appropriate for you all to know that Leslie yeah. is with us and yeah. David owned her an awful lot. Thank you. Well, one thing I was reminded of is David's advocacy for regional television, as I come from a region myself, the Waikato. You might want to say something about his role? Yes, yeah. um, David and I were on town around together, and this was 1965 in Eden. And I remember, for example, the story of town around was, as you all know, local regional programs, but they brought the community into everybody's homes. So ordinary people were seen there, and they all felt very involved in the medium, which I don't think we do now in terms of regional news. And, for example, we would be, I'd be in Belclutha interviewing Bev in Belclutha, who had 137 hand-painted ceramic thimbles. <laughs> John Lump would be her out during the Korean War amputee, who had made his dog a king of his first one in there, and his grandmother's wooden pegs. <laughs> Meanwhile, David was making, and he was the youngest of the three of us by a mile, he was making television history. The first ever current affairs debate to go out on television in New Zealand went out on DMTV2, and it was David chairing a panel with the Mayor of Dunedin, TKS Saidi, local body politicians, conservationists, and the issue was whether the arable land of Mamona should be converted into Dunedin's airport. And as you all know it now, it's. so he was, even at that very young age, yes. a remarkable broadcaster. Thank you. Thank you. Any other memories people might like to share? Um, no, I would like to say something. I'm, I'm Mark Miller, Leslie's um, youngest son, David, was um, our stepfather. Mm -hmm. And uh, David had this profound ability to uh, relate to any kind of circumstance or any person. And when he was involved in uh, broadcasting um, around the time of moving into uh, working for Jim Bolger, he had a real attitude of um, the greater good. And some, he was partisan to a certain extent, but then he would be non-partisan on, on, on when things, he didn't agree with someone. And at David's funeral, uh, Mr. Bolger told me that David had resigned four times, <laughs> and it got to a point when David would hand over his resignation because he didn't believe in something that was happening, and uh, Bolger would, throw it away and say, come on David, we're going to see this through. And so David really did stick to his um, principles in many ways. And uh, he was a man with, um, his values were quite astounding at times. And maybe even to his, to his detriment. And in the later stages or close to when he passed away, he really, really had a strong 
sort of obsessive um, feeling towards what he had been working on, which you talked about, which mm. was the address uh, mm. that, you, that happened last year. And his notions with broadcasting and ideas of free to air, um, some parliamentary, mm. you know, ideas of mm. the parliamentary um, uh, TV channel and mm. so forth. He was trying to innovate mm. and use um, public service to the best possible way, at the best sort of user-friendly price without complicating it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he, and he worked right until about the last week. And, um, you know, he, he was quite fierce in that regard, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. Thank you. Thank you very much for doing this speech. Um, I think we all owe Jeff a round of applause. Hi. Hi. I would like to thank you very, very much for what you've said. David would be very, very touched. And also, you'd be very, very um, touched by what he said as well. And you really have. Well, you just brought him back to me again. That happens all the time. Mm. But um, anyway, thank you. And thank you, Catherine. Um, there, there isn't much more I can say. But it was very, very nice for you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.